Hey there, guys, it's Metro, and today we will be meticulously comparing all six tanks along every metric I could think of ahead of Battle for Azeroth to serve as a guide for those of you who are still undecided on which tank they will play in the expansion. As this is such a long video, I have added timestamps and a TLDR breakdown of all the relevant breakdowns in the pinned comment below. The ideal use of this video will be to navigate the parts that interest you the most and offer you a chance to compare things specifically as you see fit. Now, before we begin, I would like to say that I've spent months of live streams and videos dedicated on this very topic and have gone way further playing tanks on the beta than I ever could have imagined. But as my time was split across six tunes instead of just one, I likely got a lot less done on any one than some other personalities on YouTube. The upside to this is that for the first time in my playing of the game, I feel I have a very solid command of all six tanks going into battle for Azeroth. The downside is I probably have missed minute details that would have only presented themselves with heavy continued testing, like perhaps certain and talent or Azerite trait synergies. No matter how many hours any of us have put in though, the nature of this game is always changing and the strengths and weaknesses can be heavily skewed by even a small hotfix. Everything you hear in this video will be purely my opinion and if yours differs, that's perfectly natural. I thirst for knowledge every second I breathe and constantly try to learn and improve on everything I pursue. So I'd love to hear more from you about topics that you feel you have a mastery over. However, if you do wish to have a discussion, please keep in mind that the point of this comparison is a comparison above all else. That means if you say something like Prop Paladin is the best tank outright, but you aren't willing to compare it directly to the other five tanks to explain why, then you're not helping either me or others learn. I'd ask that replies respect that concept and hope that after an accumulation of my knowledge collides with your specific experience, we can create an environment where any single World of Warcraft player can learn a great deal from us. With all that out of the way, we will begin with a short description of each tank's primary strength and weakness, where they stand relative to Legion and a summary of why I might like playing them. After that, we will begin the subsectional comparison of all six tanks along every metric I can conceive of with a short explanation of each within. So, with all that out of the way, let us begin. The Brewmaster Monk is a tank that has seen many changes since its addition to the game, but I feel we are finally in a comfortable place with their design. The philosophy present in the Monk's kit is very unique, and as such has inspired some devout fans who are dedicated to education and progression of the spec, and that alone should be considered a boon for anyone looking to try Brewmaster for the first time. The strength of the Brewmaster is undeniably their ability to smooth and shrug off physical damage, and in doing so they are second to none. No other tank can control the damage input quite Quite like a brewmaster, and as they can easily reach 100% uptime on their active mitigation, they are perfect for any experienced player looking to push the limit of specs and tanks in general. They are the undisputed kings of dealing with one huge hit, and this makes them extremely potent in raiding, but likely will always be a hindrance in their 5-man positioning, and any small group content outside of that, where there is a detriment to needing steady attention from the healer. This can be seen as their one true weakness, a lack of self-sustain and self-healing outright, almost by definition. Even though Stagger can't actually kill you by itself, it will mean you are always taking a relatively steady amount of damage, so in cases where you aren't smoothing massive hits, you'll be more of a concern to healers than other tanks would be. With respect to Legion, many holes were patched with Brewmaster, including utility concerns, both in talent tree and passively, and even though I see their self-sustain as a clear issue, I believe it is significantly better than it was in Legion, due in no small part to Azerite traits. With all that said, the specific thing that makes me enjoy Brewmaster is just how unique its entire kit can be. They are proud owners of some of the most unique utility in the game, including Ring of Peace and Black Ox Statue, and even though they are on the same talent row, they are no longer shared with Leg Sweep, making them only one of two tanks with an AoE stun. The way they mitigate damage, the way they deal damage, and the way they roll all around like a madman is start to finish an experience that you will not find in any other tank. If you can invest the time and mental effort into learning how to play the spec properly, you will not regret it. The Protection Warrior, once an infallible tanking spec with no peer, now walks the earth amongst so many competitors. With as much time as has passed since then, you'd expect Warrior to have just as many reworks, and as such, the spec battles its own identity and was losing for quite a long time. In a world where tanks could glide across the map, heal for more than healers, or have a statue tank for them, it's difficult to consider good old sword and board unique. But with BFA, they are starting to get back to the level they should be at. The strength of Warrior has always been their flexibility 
ability in reducing all types of damage, but it's struggled to compare it to Druid and Monk in recent years. Months ago, while discussing this on the channel, I said that block tanks could never compete with the models of the other tanks, but Blizzard managed to prove me wrong on the matter in Battle for Azeroth. Pack to pack, Warrior feels extremely tolerant to pain, but unfortunately, they don't ignore much of it nowadays. Compared to Legion, ignore pain is miserable, but I'd still find great power thanks to the magic reduction it might bring and some strong synergy with Azerite traits. Outside of defense itself, Warrior is significantly better off in BFA. They have far better utility thanks to baseline shockwave and being given rallying cryback and bring one of the five buffs in the game. Their damage is among the best thanks to having a percent wise DPS increase in avatar baseline as well, which is something of a rarity for tanks to have right now. If they had one true weakness, it would be their past is still haunting them. Blizzard refuses to allow Warrior to have any real self-sustain, likely thanks to their class fantasy that we've heard so much about. However, they got one small concession on the matter, with the heal and talent tied to Last Stand, which was sorely needed on such an outdated ability. In the end though, they still appear the jack of all trades and master of none. However, in terms of things I enjoy, nothing beats charging all around and hitting mobs as hard as Warrior does. The thing I like the most is just how fast paced their playstyle can be, and in a world of dwindling rotational complexity, Warrior still feels like it has a lot of different types of buttons it can press and make an impact with. If you like fast paced mobile tanks that can stand sturdy against any mob type, then Warrior will be a great choice, especially if you are one of those freaks who hates self-healing. Protection Paladin. For a while now, I've been saying that if they were able to combine Prop Paladin and Prop Warrior, it would easily be my favorite tank in the game. A big part of why that is true is again because of the legacy of the class in spec, and unlike other tanks, staying true to their origins hasn't hurt Paladin one bit. Their strength comes in a very flexible playstyle, especially now that Shield of the Righteous is an AoE offensive spell and can apply active mitigation and other benefits without actual targeting. Almost everything they do is flexible and diverse, especially when you consider they have have a cheat death, multiple types of immunities including one for magic, and a full health heal. Even though their utility isn't always as valuable as other tanks, if played well, Prop Paladin can lend a lot of aid to their group too, especially in the form of healing. Giving those key globals to other players is a dangerous line to walk, and that really exemplifies the still glaring flaw with the Prop Paladin. Paladin can choose to do a lot of things, but one thing they cannot do is to keep their active mitigation or other defensive kit up as often as they might need it. This can be particularly problematic when you consider their main offense is tied directly to their defense and on a very long CD compared to other tanks. Even one of their most unique abilities historically, Seraphim, embodies the tightrope walk quite squarely of the prop paladin. That risk and reward factor is partially why I have always loved playing a paladin and still do to this day. They always have been a very unique tank and will always bring a lot to help the group above themselves and that is still true in BFA. Paladin got some great concessions in BFA, including a great reduction tied purely to Consecrate and the Shield of the Righteous change I mentioned earlier, but unfortunately, what they really needed was a larger health pool and closer to 100% uptime on their active mitigation. Either way, if you like a tank that can do a lot of different things, including healing and preserving the group, and put out great damage to boost, you will definitely like Prop Paladin. Just make sure you aren't married to mobility. Here's hoping the Azerite traits will help with that. Vengeance Demon Hunter is obviously the most recently added tank, and they have tough shoes to fill if you compare them to Death Knights and Monks. Both tanks burst onto the scene as overwhelmingly overpowered selection, but Vengeance really struggled in its early days. Its design isn't that different in BFA compared to those early days, but the changes they did receive helped them round up to be a much more capable tank, especially in small group content. The only way to describe Demon Hunter is to alert you ahead of time to the fact that they will be top on my metrics of mobility mobility, offense, and utility. When you're the king of the pack on three of the most important metrics there can be for five mans, it tells you a lot about the tank. But aside, they are also retaining a very fast play style, despite having very few rotational abilities. However, the reason any of what I just described can even remotely be considered balanced is because they're certainly not top in the one category that really matters most, overall defense. This is without question their biggest downside, and many consider them to be the worst tank for raids because of it. Their 
defensive kit can be seen as quite flexible, including a relatively strong active mitigation and a relatively high amount of self-healing, but that is simply not enough for progression rating. Luckily, it is more than enough for Mythic Plus. In BFA, they appear to be the king of five mans all around as they top the most relevant metrics, but most noteworthy is their utility, which is made even better by their Azerite traits. To me, Demon Hunter seems almost mandatory for the tank spot in any five-man group looking to take it serious, but I may be overvaluing their kit, which of course could be nerfed at any moment. What can't be nerfed is what makes me love this tank, their insane mobility and tendency to do insane burst AoE DPS. It's just so fun leaping into a pack and topping the charts, and no matter what else changes about this spec, as long as it's retaining its mobility, it will always be an interesting pick for me. If you want to play a tank that plays more like a DPS than a tank, and love leaping all around and gliding off cliffs, then Demon Hunter is the tank for you. The Guardian Druid has had an odd road to get to this point, and as such, comparisons to Legion may be the most pertinent way to describe the state of the spec to you guys. In Legion, Bear went from utter unkillable kings to the best DPS tank to something specifically searching for a niche, all within about a year and some change. Sadly, those days don't look to be that far behind us, but I can say comfortably that Bear will always retain its physical mitigation prowess if nothing else. The one true weakness you might have come to understand about Bear is that they have no clear metric where they dominate. This shouldn't dissuade anyone from playing the spec, but when we are making a comparison list like this, if a tank doesn't do one thing best overall, then they are likely going to be defaulted to the bottom half of any consideration. But with that being said, Bear still has a very clear and potent upside. They have enormous physical mitigation and the ability to add a ton of free health thanks to their mastery. Plus, they have a decent amount of self-healing and even though the utilities and mobility options aren't amazing, they can still find very good reasons to be considered powerful. Many people will cite their lack of rotational complexity as a problem and I can understand why. But for me, it's part of what makes me like them the most. Druid as a class has a lot of ins and outs and while many of the coolest parts of this aren't present while tanking, it can still be very fun and rewarding to play a druid overall. Thanks to multiple talents, Bear brings a lot of passive damage through Moonfire and Thorns, and this plays very well into what I like most about the tanking model. They will never be the top DPS of all tanks, but their consistent damage means once you do have threat, it should require less globals to maintain it, and this of course means more focus elsewhere. All in all, a relatively straightforward tank without a lot of rotational decisions should be looked at as a good thing for many types of players. It means that things are balanced in a way that you're able to focus more on what's happening around you than what you are pressing and when it's being pressed. So if you yearn for the old days of tanking and love the fantasy of playing a bulky wall with a rich fantasy and tons of health pool, then Guardian Druid's the one for you. Blood Death Knight. As hopefully all of you know by now, Bloody K is without question my favorite spec in the entire video game, and this is because of how unique it is in almost every facet of its play. To me, this is their true strength and is infallible in its value thanks to such. You have some of the most powerful and unique utility in the game thanks to Death Grip, and you have the ability to outheal the healer, especially on AoE, and the way you deliver damage will be perfectly in line for five mans thanks to the recommitment to Blood Boil's power combined with a low CD on Dancing Rune Weapon. Unfortunately though, compared to Legion, Blood Decay really lives up to its billing as the veteran of some war. The artifact was powerful for many specs, but I think it's no exaggeration to say that Bloods was spec defining, and every single gold trait, as well as some of the standard traits, changed Blood from a pretty solid tank to a Titan. Blood Decay's niche still is, and likely always will be, huge self-healing and punishing AoE DPS, but you won't be breaking any rules anywhere near as quickly as you did into last expansion, especially thanks to the secondary stat nerf, which absolutely devastated Blood Death Knight. As we now get less haste percentage per point, and of course are back to the start of a gearing curve, expect very slow runic regeneration for the first few weeks, at least until raids open. And this means many dead spots in the rotation, as well as far more selection on your death strike usage. With all that said, the obvious weakness to Blood Decay is that their main mitigation comes in the form of such a resource-driven rotation, and this can eventually turn into their strength, but for the 
the first few months in BFA, it's very important that anyone picking blood recognizes and understands this. On top of that, mobility has never been our strongest point, and they again will likely suffer in BFA, but thanks to some interesting Azerite traits and Death's Advance returning, you now have immunity to knockbacks and a very capable speed boost. So things should be better overall, especially in situations where you can comfortably take Wraithwalk as a talent. Obviously, when I talk about Blood DK, everything about them is what I like the most, but if I could say one thing to help you decide for or against the spec, it's do you like feeling entirely self-sufficient as the tank? Historically, and especially in Legion, Blood Death Knight needed the least attention from healers and had multiple synergies with actual throughput healers thanks to vampiric blood. With that power in your pocket, you can easily find yourself in a position where you solo save many types of encounters after the rest of your group is dead and bickering, and I must say, there is nothing that strokes the ego more than seeing four people squabbling about their failure in a Mythic Plus encounter while I'm comfortably finishing it. So if you like a tank with a lot of reactionary gameplay instead of preventative gameplay, and like the solo stuff, even really hard stuff, then I welcome you to the Blood Death Knight Army. All right, so now we'll begin the second part of the video where we're going to rank and compare all six tanks on every relevant metric in order to help you know exactly which tank you want to play based on which metrics you value most. One more reminder that these are again all my opinions and that I can go on about many of these individual topics for hours on their own, but we'll avoid doing so to make the video as concise as possible. So let's begin. First one we'll examine is physical mitigation. What's important about physical mitigation to me? Consistent smoothing of damage first and foremost. Large cooldowns can be useful, but generally are less applicable when your typical damage profile consists of many melee attacks or standard physical debuffs. Number one, Brewmaster. Best physical mitigation toolkit likely ever in the game and likely ever to be in the game. Easily 100% uptime and prevents spiking at all opportunities. No apparent downside for any type of content where physical damage is the focus of the tank profile. Number two, Bear Druid. Extremely potent active mitigation tied together with natural bulk with mastery and a strong CD allocation, albeit all being long CDs. True power comes from being able to stack multiple iron fur applications on a relatively high uptime alongside being something heavily supported by gear and azurite traits. Number three, Protection Warrior. Revitalized block model with revamped talent tree and a wide array of CDs to assure strong forms of mitigation, but with spotty uptime. Something that will get better as gear progresses through the expansion. Number four, Protection Paladin. Benefiting from revamped block model as well, new talents and a Consecrate rework, but still suffering heavily from difficulty with active mitigation, uptime, and strength. Will rely on multiple long CDs and self-healing kits, but still a much more capable mitigator compared to its Legion counterparts. Number five, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Extremely potent active mitigation, but even longer recharge window than it was in Legion, meaning obvious gaps in defense. Vengeance relies on high health, certain CDs and passives, and HPS to survive, but this makes them very inflexible when it comes to taking consistent large physical hits that you might need to smooth. And number six, Blood Death Knight. Obviously the worst tank for mitigating any type of physical hit, as instead of reducing the main mitigation form comes in simply healing up the damage afterwards. A recommitment to mastery being a valuable stat should see a dramatic increase in their ability to absorb physical hits with comparison to Legion, but the model is always going to be about surviving, then healing, instead of reducing for your standard physical damage profile. Next metric on the list is magic defense. What's important to me about magic defense? Unlike physical damage, most magic damage comes in large burst windows. Therefore, consistency is less important than reliable large cooldowns and other forms of reaction. Magic damage often comes in the form of debuffs as well as outright damage, so recovery windows are also crucial. Number one, Blood Death Knight. Without question, best magic defender thanks to anti-magic shell and its associated talent. Icebound Fortitude and of course standard self-healing help to cover any other gaps in magic defense. AMS provides extra benefit as it usually absorbs a debuff while active, potentially saving even more damage or having an extended impact on how other people deal with the mechanic. 
Number two, Protection Warrior. Warrior features great, frequently usable magic mitigation tool in Ignore Pain, which has a lot of synergy with Talons and Azerite traits, despite its nerf state from Legion. However, also has a wide array of CDs, most importantly, including Spell Reflect, which is on a very short CD and reduces magic damage outright, and of course, will be able to actually reflect some spells for extra benefit. Number three, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Features a passive that reduces all damage taken by 10%, which isn't remarkable for physical, but can be very useful for magic, despite being commonly considered a balancing tool for gaps in their kit. Soul Fragment changes also allow for much better reaction to what you don't mitigate, and they still have relatively strong CDs and talents, including Soul Barrier. Number four, Protection Paladin. Unique talent allowing them to block spells. Remainder of their magic reduction will come from CDs or passively in their kit, but most notably, they have magic immunity for 10 seconds on a three minute cooldown. This cooldown is prohibitive, but the nature of the spell can easily be the most valuable mitigation under the right conditions. Also have lay on hands, strong self healing, and bubble as a last resort. Number five, Brewmaster. Changes to their baseline kit allow for slightly better magic mitigation than would have been present in previous expansions and offer way more in the way of healing and recovery, especially when coupled with Azerite traits and talents. The jump from four to five is great though, make no mistake. Brewmaster will be considerably weaker to magic than normal damage profiles consisting of physical only. And of course, worst number six, Bear Druid. Far too many things lost from the start of Legion to consider them competent mitigators by any stretch of the imagination. We'll rely exclusively on CDs and their large health pool for mastery to survive magic, with the only upside being the reactive strength of Frenzied Regeneration. Next metric on the list is self-sustain. What's important to me about self-sustain? A combination of mitigation and self-preservation healing, however that proliferates. Most vital element is how independent you could be of your healer and how often they will need to save you from your own mistakes. Number one, Blood Death Knight. The main tanking model the spec carries is all about self-sustain instead of actual mitigation and as such, if played and geared well, easily able to keep yourself alive for an extended period of time without any actual healing from the healer. Less potent than in Legion, of course, but many Azerite traits will continue to help with this over the expansion. Number two, Protection Paladin. Lost much of why Hand of the Protector was so strong from Legion, but still incredibly potent at self-sustain. Featuring a long list of self-sustained tools, including multiple immunities, a full health heal on a long CD, a short active heal through Hand of the Protector, Azerite traits to help with healing and absorbs, and of course, the ability to cast Flash of Light on yourself, which does significantly more healing than it did in previous expansions. Number three, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Passive damage mitigation plus very potent yet inconsistent active mitigation puts Demon Hunter in a great spot with self-sustain. Also given great new healing mechanics to help with spikes of damage in order to recover quickly. Less healing overall than Legion and certainly will need help but in many situations can use their utility, DPS, and mobility to also impact their sustain unlike any other tank. Number four, Bear Druid. The drop off from number three to number four is very large, but Bear Druid does have some semi-capable tools for self-sustain. Much of their upside comes from high natural bulk, but frenzied regeneration coupled with the right talents and Azerite traits can heavily impact the amount of healing the abilities do. Resto Affinity also ties in a decent amount of healing and offers a last ditch resort to shift out and heal yourself for a significant amount. Number five, Brewmaster Monk. Very poor self-sustain naturally due to how Stagger and their mitigation overall works, but thanks to model changes and new Azerite traits have considerably more to offer than they did in Legion. A very skilled player can also do unique things with certain utility and mobility options like kiting and ring a piece, and they could hard cast heal themselves, although it requires a non-trivial resource unlike Paladin. Number six, Protection Warrior. Was gifted a strong self-heal tied to Last Stand that can be more usable with a talent, but outside of lucky Victory Rush procs, poor talent choices, or Azerite traits, Warrior will absolutely have the worst self-sustain outright, relying purely on mitigation and potential absorbs from Ignore Pain, which was obviously massively nerfed in BFA. Next up, my favorite metric, utility. What's important about utility to me? First, we'll start with the definition. Utility, to me, is an ability that does not directly impact your ability to reduce damage, self-heal, travel, or deal damage, but will have a heavy impact on the flow of content, the capabilities of your group members, and the ability to overcome awkward and dangerous situations that might be considered irregular in the game. The more unique and more applicable, the more important the utility. Commonly, more useful in small group content than in large group content. 
Number one, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Unbelievably wide utility kit and especially in five mans should be considered invaluable. Sigils alone plus the new Azerite trait will make up for a majority of the strength thanks to them all being AoE interrupts in some way as well as one being a talented grip. Also have a ranged interrupt, magic dispel, the best party buff in the game, a hard CC, and very seldom the ability to leap or glide over areas that might benefit the way others traverse those areas. And of course they also have Spectral Sight which does has some niche usages like in a tall Dazar. Number two, Blood Death Knight. Death Grip and a nerfed Gorfiend's Grasp are still without question the highest impact utility in the game for any content where it's applicable. However, this is generally only five mans. When it is available in raids, it can still be extremely strong. Also a Battle Res, which is most valuable on a tank, especially one who could solo the content, and a talent to apply a heavy slow to D&D targets. Also have a moderately ranged Interrupt and various defensive elements like AMS that can actually change how the fight progresses for other players in your group, as well as a unique two-taunt situation situation, which will help dramatically with threat and swaps in all types of PvE content. Number three, Protection Warrior. A very wide and invaluable utility kit for all types of content, especially thanks to Rallying Cry's return. Warrior has one of only two AoE stuns in the game for tanks, and as such will always be useful in five mans or any AoE situation in raids. Also bringing one of three raid buffs that could be applied via cast, and again, can be very useful in small group content. Also have minor utility options in the talent tree, including a single target stun, and of course, Intimidating Shout, which can have extra value as an AoE interrupt. They also have access to the safeguard talent, which provides very niche but very powerful damage split on another target, most likely your co-tank in raids. Number four, Brewmaster Monk. Monk went from having very little utility, all competing with each other in Legion, to having a lot more utility, but still with heavy competition. Monk still has hard CC and paralysis, and now has leg sweep baseline as one of two AoE stuns in the game for tanks, and also received one of the best party buffs in the game. Most importantly, Monk has the ability to have either Black Ox Statue or Ring of Peace from the talent tree, both which bring an entirely unique and powerful utility. Black Ox Statue especially seems very powerful, as the ability to add an AoE taunt and even a briefer spite from tanking if done right can be utterly broken in mythic plus or raid fights where ads spawn in through the encounter Number five, Bear Druid. Bear has a very small but very powerful utility kit and of course features one of two tanks with the battle res. They still have Stampeding Roar, which isn't what it used to be without the artifact or the guttural roars talent, but still will have huge impact in certain cases. They also still have a knockback, an AoE interrupt, and the seldom usage of entangling roots, which does have some value given the infested affix, but obviously is better done on other druid specs. Finally, they got a new utility returning to the game in Soothe, which dispels all enrages, including including the Raging Affix in Mythic Plus. This was formerly not available to bears early in the beta, but was given to them last minute and will of course help to solidify them as capable utility tanks. And number six is Protection Paladin. Protection Paladin is certainly not bereft of utility, but the utility it does have is very niched and will have limited usage pull to pull in almost any type of content. A good utility kit, as mentioned earlier, includes things that must be regularly useful, not just available. And this is something that Paladin has struggled with ever since the removal of the fabled party buffs. Almost all the utility is based on group preservation, and this can be useful in many cases, but requires above average skill to use well and likely will never have the impact many other types of utility would have. Importantly, the ability to heal the group with Hand of the Protector has been devastated by BFA as it's now on the GCD, is based on your health instead of the target's health, and doesn't have the benefit of legendary helm or trait relics. Outside of that, things like Sack, Freedom, and Bop Slash Spell Warding will have some relative value, but again, won't always be usable or useful, and are doubled up on by many other classes, including Holy Paladin, which of course will continue to remain high meta in BFA. They do still have the best range interrupt in the game, which comes from Avenger's Shield, allowing them interrupts ability many times consecutively, although it does require forethought and saving of the spell's DPS to maximize. Overall, the one thing Powden is squarely missing is that intangible group benefit that every team needs, such as a battle res, a displacement, or a real group buff. However, they do have very unique Azerite traits that will allow them to give speed to the group whenever they use Divine Steed, and that has the potential to be extremely powerful depending on how the future and the trait unfolds. They also still have access to Repentance for hard CC, but it's in direct competition with their only AoE interrupts. And finally, they have the ability to cleanse diseases and poisons, but these things are almost never valuable outside of Mythic Plus. 
Next up on the metric list is mobility. And why is mobility important to me? Mobility, by definition, is the ability to move your character. And this is characterized by usually doing it in a fast and powerful way. Sometimes these ways are so powerful that they double dip into other metrics that we've talked about, like utility or survival. But for today, we're only going to focus on how mobility helps the tank using it, specifically more than anyone else. This is important as, almost all times, moving fast is better than moving slow. Number one, the Vengeance Demon Hunter. Without question, the Vengeance Demon Hunter is the most mobile tank and also features some of the most unique forms of mobility ever in the game. The ability to glide can be situationally huge, including as a prevention of knockbacks, but oftentimes the ability to leap, especially twice in a row, can allow you to skip to platforms or ledges that are near, but would require another route for those on foot. And in very rare situations, leap also allows you to soak multiple mechanics very quickly. Demon Hunter will cover the most ground in the shortest time regardless of where they started and because of this they are also a very capable kiter Number two, Protection Warrior. Warrior is going to be able to cover almost as much ground as Demon Hunter, but as they only have access to one leap, modified by talents that limit their utility, a lot of what they'll rely on is charging to enemies and players alike. This can be extremely powerful in many situations, but it's quite rare that the target will be perfect distance away so that you can cover the most ground and still not put yourself in a bad position. Most problematic is using charge out of combat means you either need to be behind other players to be used properly or to try to target critters or some other trivial target. Number three, Brewmaster Monk. Monk is definitely a close peer to Warrior, but will overall be hindered by the lack of a leap-like ability. Instead, they are much more capable kiters than the other tanks, but in a world where nerfs to slows and threat problems exist, this will be a lot less important than simply running a little bit faster. Monk still has Transcendence that can be used for some trickery, but outside of rolls, their kit is much more limited than those above them. Number four, Blood Death Knight? Putting Blood DK fourth shows, first of all, just how big of a difference there is between the third spot and the fourth spot, but it also shows just how strong the addition of Death's Advance and the March of the Damned Azerite trait can actually be, especially combined with Wraithwalk. Tanking Wraithwalk as a talent does feel really bad, but in Raids, you really don't need any of the other options on that talent row, so it's effectively a free choice. The choice between the talents there make kiting significantly harder than it was in Legion, but it is a perfectly fair trade-off to gain a knockback immunity with such a short CD. Wait until you tank mother as a death knight and enjoy watching everyone else scramble to stay in range while you're just standing there laughing as they slide on by. Number five, Protection Paladin. Paladin is historically looked at as the least mobile class, but as mentioned in an earlier section, the Azerite trait for Divine Steed plus the talent can really help bridge the gap. They, like every other tank in the bottom half of the mobility ranking, will struggle heavily to close gaps, kite, and get out in front of your group, but if you use what you have available at the right time, it can still be very capable of a speed boost. And of course, number six is Bear Druid. Druid as a class used to have so much mobility, it was silly, but now Bear especially struggles very heavily compared to other tanks. They are simply going to have to rely on their talents and interrupt itself for gap closing, and their best mobility puts them in cat form, which obviously seriously hinders any chance of actually kiting under most situations. Their only real options are cat affinity, which will hurt their self-healing, and stampeding roar, which is taking a great utility and using it poorly just to move a bit faster. Bear Druid really needs some help in the mobility and kiting department and i really hope they get it sooner rather than later all right next up how much damage can a tank do aka dps why it's important obviously the more damage you do the less damage you might take over the course of the encounter with the increase in five man relevance if your tank is top dps or bottom dps is going to significantly change how you approach said content but you also see many guilds worrying heavily about tank dps in raids as well to help lower kill times of bosses or specific ads on specific encounters it is simply an invaluable thing that requires a lot of careful play but will help no matter what as always always. Number one, Vengeance Demon Hunter. At one point, I would have easily been sure that damage from Vengeance Demon Hunter was going to get nerfed, and it still might. But as of right now, they're without question kings of AoE and overall damage, thanks to how much of their damage comes off the global and within the first two globals. Vengeance doesn't even have a DPS increase or any specific power-ups. Their abilities simply hit harder than other tank abilities and will likely continue to do so for a long time. Most definitely seems like a trade-off for their awkward mitigation kit. 
Number two, Protection Warrior. Warrior has the unique benefit of being one of two tanks with a very strong damage increase CD, now baseline with Avatar. They also have a super powerful talent in Dragon Roar, and when stacked together with the rest of their kit, they'll be able to do very high amounts of burst DPS. The clear downside for tanks below Demon Hunter is, in order to really maximize their DPS, they're going to have to forego a lot of defense. When doing so, Prot Warrior will still bring a lot of AoE and an amount of single target that will be well above average. Number 3, Protection Paladin. Paladin is in a very similar boat to Warrior, but with even harsher trade-offs. Paladin's big CD will come with wings, and that is one, unlike Warrior's, that could also have efficacy as defense. They also now have incredible burst, single target, and AoE, thanks to the changes to Shield of the Righteous, but again, it will require blowing all of your defense on the pull. The biggest trade-off yet comes with the use of the talent Seraphim, which shines light even further on the problem with their mitigation, but will still be exceptionally strong for DPS at the start of the expansion especially. Number 4, The Blood Death Knight. Blood DK is back to its old tricks thanks to Blood Boil and a shorter Dancing Rune Weapon CD, but will likely fall behind on any single target pure situation as other tanks continue to get gear and traits. At least for AoE, proper usage of Blood Boil during procs or things like Lust and Rune Weapon will easily help you top the charts, but low haste early will make Blood Drinker a hard trade-off and harder to use even more while taking real damage. Number 5, Brewmaster Monk. Monk was capable of dealing very high amounts of damage in Legion thanks to specific legendary and artifact combinations, but without that present, they are back to being below average for damage outright. Their main problem is effectively half their damage comes from only two abilities, and without any DPS CD anywhere in sight, this will lead to a shorter burst window after those initial globals than any tank ahead of them, as well as lower sustained DPS overall. And finally, number six, Guardian Druid. Bear, without question, as the worst offensive kit in the game, and the only saving grace is how much of their damage actually comes over time. Things like the Thrash Dot, Moonfire, and Brambles will help them stay relatively capable in the damage department, but without Incarnation, their on-demand damage is effectively non-existent and needs serious help if it's going to stay balanced, especially given the threat changes and how much burst your co-tank might have in raids. Next up on the list is the complicated Azerite trait metric. Now I have an entire video on Azerite traits which you really should check out. But long story short, these will be extremely powerful items that you will mix and match frequently, not just stick with one BIS setup for the entire expansion. A comparison of these will be very difficult and subjective, but for this metric I'll be considering things like which ones can fill the most gaps in the class's kit, which ones offer the most advancement along the lines of the tank's perspective, and which ones have the potential to become overpowered over time. Yet again, number one, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Vengeance's spread of traits is really something unique and most notably contains one of the most overpowered ones in Cycle of Binding, which grants agility for every sigil used and reduces the cooldown on all sigils by four seconds each time one is used. Regardless of any potential stacking or power increase here, being able to use all sigils more often and get offense from them all is absurd and going to solidify Demon Hunter as the best utility tank outright, especially because almost no other tank gains any significant utility buff from these Azerite traits. Outside of that, they had things that patched their kit as well, like Infernal Armor, making Immolation Aura a small defensive CD with extra offense tied in. Number two, Guardian Druid. If you played in Legion, you would know that Bear had some insanely strong legendary and relic effects, and that isn't something they are looking to go away from in BFA. At first glance, Bear has two of the best traits in the game for outright actual tanking. Gory Regeneration being the most rotation changing, it offers one extra second on an active frenzied regen every time you hit a target with Mangle, as well as making it heal for an additional amount every second. This sounds pretty good on paper, but it's even better in practice if you can take Incarnation and hit maximum targets with every Mangle. At that point, you would easily be keeping Frenzied Regen up the entire time it was on CD. Even hitting two targets with Mangle during Incarnation will double the duration and allow you to keep it up for the full Incarnation duration. The only downsides here are that they don't seem to stack, meaning you can't get much value out of this without Incarnation as a talent or on single target, and obviously Frenzied Regeneration's duration nerf heavily impacts how difficult it's going to be to extend this without the talent and with low haste. For all the situations where that trait doesn't seem overpowered, you have layered main and Guardian's Wrath to combine for huge power. Guardian's Wrath makes Maul reduce the cost of Iron First, stacking up to three times, and Layered Main increases your agility and gives a chance to grant multiple applications of Iron Fur. It's not known what stacks with these yet, but regardless, getting free double stacks of Iron Fur is going to make Bear even better at physical mitigation than they already are. Ready? 
Number three, Brewmaster. Monk has the definition of traits that patch holes in the class. They have four different traits that offer some significant amount of healing, and of course will fully stack and increase in power with item level, potentially making Brewmaster a very capable self-healer by the end. However, another top-tier trait resides in the hand of Brewmaster, known as Training of Nizao, which grants you a high amount of mastery based on your current level of stagger. Having three high item level versions of this will make Brewmaster absurdly tanky, and if the numbers we see scaling are anything like what will eventually happen, it's going to happen quickly. They even have some DPS options to improve their all-around kit if absolutely needed. Number four, Protection Warrior. Warrior traits are a bit of a letdown as they get no real healing, but instead get more block and more DPS, which they already have plenty of. They do have two very strong and interesting traits, however. The first being Blood Sport, which makes Ignore Pain absorb more and grant you a modest amount of leech for eight full seconds. This, of course, fully stacks, and with three high item level traits, you will easily have leech cap constantly, and Ignore Pain may be heavily worth using in all situations again like it used to be. This may actually turn Prot Warrior into a high HPS tank again, but probably won't act to patch the gap they need in self-healing unless the leech gets really out of control. Even better though is Deafening Crash, a trait I've been using as the perfect example of why this system can be amazing. Deafening Crash makes Thunderclap do more damage, but also makes it extend the duration of Demo Shout on targets hit by it by one second. Now it's peculiar because it appears to have a built-in failsafe, where if Thunderclap hits multiple targets who have Demo Shout, it will not grant additional seconds for each additional stacking trait. However, this does stack on single target. So with three traits and and the right talents, you can easily keep Demo Shout up 100% of the time on single target encounters. It is possible there are bugs present here, considering how it favors single target over AoE, but if this is working as intended, it's going to be one of the most unique and powerful traits in the entire game. Number 5, Blood Death Knight. Blood Decay probably has the widest array of talents that can have a big impact, but it's hard to see any one of them being overpowered like some of the ones we discussed above. The ones most noteworthy are Runic Barrier, which will be very strong in raid fights with a lot of magic, and March of the Damned, which gives a bunch of speed every time you use Death's Advance, patching sorely needed gaps and benefiting heavily from stacking an item level. They are both utility traits as well, so you don't even have to choose between them and the main DPS ones. In terms of standard class-specific traits, we have the famous Embrace of the Dark Fallen, which I covered in my Azerite video. The example I showed there was a heroic Uldir version giving 8.5% leech every time vamp blood expires, which stacked to over 28% with three traits and of course is only from heroic of the first raid tier. Simply an insane and of course will change heavily how we think about haste for red thirst and DPS within the leech window. They also have some other very unique traits like Eternal Rune Weapon, which grants you some strength and makes any rune spent during rune weapon increase the duration of rune weapon by up to an additional 5 seconds. This was one of the first traits I latched onto, and at the time it fully stacked. I assume it still does to this day, so that means for 5 mans, multiple stacks of this trait will easily assure you 5 extra seconds of Dancing Rune Weapon, thanks to Merorend giving double value per global, something you'll of course be using at least twice anyway now that we only get 6 Bone Shield stacks per use during Rune Weapon. Number 6, Protection Paladin. Prop Paladin easily has the worst main tier traits, and as they don't patch any real holes in the kit, many of them are just natural extensions of things that already are working well for Paladin. One of interest is Righteous Bastion, which grants the Shield of the Righteous damage reduction slightly longer duration and makes the ability do more damage, but this likely still won't ever lead to 100% uptime, especially if the duration does not stack. Either way, it can be coupled with other traits for Shield of the Righteous that make it grant things like block and more AoE damage. However, the most interesting trait actually is Gallant Steed, which is a utility tier trait. The trait reads, inspires yourself and nearby allies when Divine Steed is active, granting them speed for 5 seconds. Also reduces the CD of Steed to 40 seconds. Now for reference, a 380 item level version of this trait grants 602 speed. That's just one trait. Assuming this fully stacks, you're going to be bringing an insane amount of speed and utility to the group if you prioritize getting these traits, but it is unlikely you're going to be hard pressed to find three 380 versions of this trait. Regardless, for all that the main prot traits failed to do, this utility trait may very well save Paladin entirely depending on how it works out. And the final comparative metric for today is going to be ease of use and simplicity of the tank. So why is this important to me? For many, they may be just starting with the tank role and are looking to find a tank that can be easier to play and will be less prone to mistakes. This can also be important for advanced players who are looking to maximize their raid awareness where the less spell interactions you have can actually be a benefit.
Number one, Bear Druid. Finally, something Bear is top at. Wait, this is not something you likely want to top, at least for competitive content, but it's quite apparent that unless a rework is coming, Bear has almost no rotational interactions and a very cut and dry approach to mitigating damage. The only thing you need to be aware of is when people die, you need to battle res them. Number two, Protection Paladin. Now, if your primary concern is to never worry about anything other than your own survival, Paladin's mitigation model is extremely simple and offers a lot of strength for almost no downsides. However, if you wish to become more advanced, be aware you'll have to meticulously walk the tightrope on things like DPS maximization and how to use your utility to help and save your group. For a beginning tank, a vast majority of situations you would be in would not require any of these things, so Paladin can be a great choice for you. Number three, Vengeance Demon Hunter. Vengeance is a unique case as I would recommend them for the exact opposite reasons of Paladin or Bear. For those who have never played a tank before, it's probably best to start out with a tank that actually plays more like a DPS than an actual tank. They have a frightfully low amount of actual tanking interactions, but get so much extra health and passive mitigation that in low difficulty situations, they wouldn't even care if they did have them. Meanwhile, you can bring absurd DPS extremely easily, bring the best buff in the game just by attacking, and can jump around around like when you were young hopping on your bed until you hit your head on the ceiling fan and your father freaked out. Number four, Protection Warrior. Protection Warrior is in a similar boat to Vengeance, but will be significantly more complicated when it comes time to actually mitigate damage ahead of DPS. Warrior is a great target for beginners because they have a little of everything, and despite having the most active abilities and interactions of any tank spec, their actual DPS rotation is very, very basic. The biggest problem for new players will be dealing with the gaps in mitigation, and doing so well will require an advanced mindset. Number five, Blood Death Knight. Blood DK operates differently than every other tank in the game in the fact that you want to take the damage first, survive it, then deal with it. So some people might consider that easier, but in my eyes, this makes it more difficult. The first few times you play Blood, you'll likely feel very unstable, and especially in those opening globals of combat, you'll find yourself near death many times. The eventual mastery of Blood will only come with education of the content you're doing, as you need to know exactly how much damage you will take and when in order to properly maximize your DPS and HP at the same time, and especially early, the latter will be mandatory. Unlike all the tanks above them, if you just never interact with your main form of mitigation, you might as well be wearing cloth, because there is no way your healer or healers can keep you alive without you helping them do so. And to no one's surprise, number six, Brewmaster Monk. Brewmaster is uniquely complicated thanks to Stagger and its subsequent removal, and learning the ins and outs of the spec can be very daunting. In my eyes, a bad Brewmaster basically does nothing valuable in the tank role, but a great Brewmaster can make every other person's job much easier, especially thanks to their new utility and self-healing additions in Battle for Azeroth. This is absolutely not a tank for beginners, and even advanced tanks who have played other classes will find a lot of difficulty predicting damage, clearing Stagger, and maximizing their positioning and DPS. Furthermore, it's almost mandatory that you use add-ons like weak ores to track your HP, energy, and stagger. The default systems work all right for other tanks, but you need to be far more aware for a tank like Brewmaster. And to conclude the video, we're now going to talk more about more general comparison metrics. This one's going to be the five-man verdict, discussing which tank is best for five-mans and kind of doing a mini tier list like I used to do in the old days, uh, ranking all six tanks based on everything we have talked about. I refer to individual sections to learn more, but this is just a general overview in line with the other sections that we've done so far. Tier 1 number 1 is Vengeance Demon Hunter. Demon Hunter brings the best DPS, best utility, best mobility, and best upside from Azerite traits out of all 6 tanks. The only trade-off you have to be concerned with with all this in mind is their apparent lack of easy survival, but only time will tell if it will be so severe that it will keep them from staying at the top of the heap for 5 mans this expansion. Tier 1 number 2 is Blood Death Knight. Blood's model is perfectly suited to 5 mans in every conceivable way, and that likely will never change unless they completely redesign the class. High AoE DPS, huge utility upsides, and such a high amount of self-sustain that even after all we've lost from Legion, we can still easily outheal healers. The only downside to Blood DK was mobility, and even that has gotten better in Battle for Azeroth. But compared to Vengeance, they are simply a notch behind. 
Tier 2, number 1, number 3 overall, to many people's surprise, might be Brewmaster Monk. The main thing holding Monk back has and always will be their lack of self-sustain, as I would have said in the past, but this has gotten significantly lessened with respect to Legion. They'll likely never be a top HPS tank, and they will likely always need help from the healer, but they are simply so absurdly good at dealing with physical damage that they have to be considered a very viable tank for Serious Mythic Plus, especially before the massive overgearing of the expansion's full curve begins. On top of that... They now bring some of the best and most unique utility in the game, and a lot less of it is in direct competition with each other. Tier 2, number 2, number 4 overall is Protection Warrior. Prot Warrior's newfound bulk is going to really shine in 5 man's day to day for the same reason Monks will, but a lot of their viability will depend on whether Warrior DPS specs remain in the high meta. Right now, almost nothing unique comes from Prot, but Prot still has tremendous upsides thanks to an expanded utility kit that features an AoE stun, a group wide health increase, spell reflect, and very potent DPS. Tier 3, number 1, number 5 overall is Prop Paladin. Paladin can put out insane DPS, do insane self-healing, and even bring a lot of healing to the group. The problem is, it's likely all at a dramatic cost to their own ability, and will often have a heavy impact on their survival. Paladin is slightly better overall from Legion, but their lack of stable mitigation tied to such a high amount of DPS upside will always make them a tough pick early when survival counts more. You have to really play their utility kit well, including healing and putting blessings on the group constantly, and eventually using their new speed boost trait to its fullest if you ever want to compete with the top tier tanks in Mythic Plus. And tier 3, number 2, last overall is Bear Druid. Unfortunately, Guardian just doesn't check enough boxes, and the thing it does do well, other tanks simply do better easier. Druid utility has gotten a bit more interesting thanks to Soothe, but the loss of guttural roars, the gutting of their DPS, and the lack of any real mobility make Bear a very tough pick in light of the other options. Luckily, Battle Res and Bulk is all most groups will ever really need, but I imagine it will be unlikely we will see Bear above any other tank until Blizzard decides to throw them a bone. And last but not least, the last thing we're going to be talking about here today is the raid kit and raid viability. This is basically a mini tier list ranking all six tanks based on everything we've talked about up until this point. So if you need to find more information, please revert to the individual sections to learn more. Tier 1, number 1, number 1 overall is Brewmaster Monk. Monk in the number 1 spot for rating really should be no surprise to anyone following the development of the game. The rating damage profile is of course dominated by heavy melee damage and often massive melee damage and Brewmaster combines 100% uptime on mitigation and easily the best counter to any huge spikes of damage possible in Stagger. All of their conceived drawbacks we might have discussed in 5 mans or other content simply don't factor in heavily in raids, especially when you are worried about raw survival above everything else. Even better, their utility kit can play a very versatile role in their strength on the more unique encounters you might find. Tier 1, number 2. Number 2 overall is Bear Druid. Bear Druid also features an absurdly bulky physical mitigation kit with no concerns on uptime of mitigation and also has Azerite traits to significantly bolster their chances. Just like Monk, all the problems one might find with Bear in other content simply won't matter as much in raids. And they also feature utility that can have a very big impact on many different types of raid encounters, including an AoE speed boost. Tier 2, number 1, number 3 overall is Blood Death Knight. Blood is simply the king of magic tanking, and all the major problems that plague the tanks below them on this list simply don't apply to them. That is, they don't rely on mitigation or its uptime to actually survive. Their active mitigation itself has almost no impact on their gameplay, and as long as played well, their self-healing will always provide more benefit than any other option, as long as you can actually survive the hit, which may be difficult early. More so, they have the single best utility in the game for raiding up and this point as long as it's relevant that being grips there are many fights where ads are a vital element and not having grips or gorfiends can lead to significantly more time spent dealing with them their main detriment everywhere else being mobility is also heavily lessened in raids Tier 3, number 1, number 4 overall is Protection Warrior. Warrior and the two remaining tanks below all suffer from one significant drawback, and that being the main way they survive damage not being available every time they need it, which differs heavily from the tanks ahead. That being said, Warrior is a very capable defender and has some hugely impactful Azerite traits that we have discussed earlier in the video. Things go how I expect for Warrior, they will slowly creep up further and further on the chart with each passing day as players get more access to Azerite traits and artifact power. And of course, they have the single best preservation CD for raids possible in Rallying Cry, which now stands as the only option from a tank slot. 
tier three. Number two, number five overall is Protection Paladin. Much like Warrior, the kit of a Paladin has gotten better in BFA and will continue to steadily get better over time. The things they do best, however, don't seem particularly well suited to raids in my eyes, and they lack the potency of Azerite traits the other tanks have that will help them climb over time. Paladin deals well with consistent magic damage, of which there is a decent amount in Uldir, but they will be focused on pouring all of their preservation spells into themselves and will be forced to play far more conservative with talents and gearing to make up for the big gaps in their mitigation. And tier 4 number 1 number 6 overall is Vengeance Demon Hunter. To be clear, the gap between the top 5 tanks is all relatively narrow, but the last spot is quite markedly worse than the others, which is why I structured this in a way t- as to include a 4th tier with Vengeance alone in it. As mentioned many times in this video, Vengeance dominates DPS, mobility, and utility metrics, but falls heavily in the actual tanking metrics, and this is far more important in rating, especially the first tier. Furthermore, almost all of the Azerite traits seem to be heavily designed for five mans, and anyone playing Demon Hunter should expect this trend to dominate their position through Battle for Azeroth. Overall, they are outstanding five man tanks, but until they address their active mitigation and CDs, they will never shine in any raid fight you have to actually rely heavily on your tanks to survive. Oh, so that's the video. What'd you think? I'd have to say, if you made it this far and watched the entire video, you really must be committed to learning about this topic. Give yourself a pat on the back. If that is actually the case, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these topics discussed here as well, especially if you feel you have extra knowledge I might have missed in the video. As a reminder, the main focus of the video was not just the tanks themselves, but comparing them directly against each other. And as such, if you're about to leave a comment, I have to ask that you do the same. I'd love for a continuation of this video to culminate in a healthy the comment section where those watching can learn more of our discussion so as long as you are willing to compare all six tanks in each field as I am and remember that these are purely my opinions then together we should be able to make that happen. Thanks again for watching and I hope this helped you solidify which tank you might want to play for which reasons and this will be a valuable asset as the expansion progresses through its early weeks and months. In the future I'll continue making comparison videos somewhat similar to this but mostly focus on Mythic Plus in the form of tier lists as I did in Legion and likely expand to more roles besides just tanks. I hope to see you guys there and on the many streams coming with Battle for Azeroth. So until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.